Hello everyone, this is Jonas Pils, Master Trainer at Maxon, and I want to welcome you to this new webinar series, this Demystifying Monday webinar series about Redshift. In June, we are going to talk about, well, different techniques um, of creating materials and setting up renders in Redshift. And yeah, this is what we're going to do. So I'm going to take care of the housekeeping today. So I want to start, um, well, showing you the events page as you might have, um, well, thought already. So this is the Maxon events page. And here you can see all of the exciting uh, webinars and shows that we are running. It's, it's a lot. And here you can also see the demystifying post-production Redshift materials part one. This is what we're doing today. Um, once I click it, you can see all of the other things that we are going to cover. So today we're going to talk about materials, um, yeah, PBR materials and lighting setups and stuff like that. Um, we are going to be joined by Lionel VC Domini for that, who's also hello. master trainer. Um, and that was him saying hello. <laughs> Hi Lionel, how are you doing? I'm fine, how are you? Well, I'm also fine, thanks. Um, yeah, next week we're going to talk about procedural materials entirely. Then the week after about hair in Redshift. And then in the last week, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to try, um, well, we're going to try to create uh, an everyday um, together, um, yeah, via, uh, via internet. So we are going to share uh, the same files and so on and try to create something beautiful. All right, um, other than our demystifying post-production Mondays, we have other stuff to share um, when it comes to events. For example, we are running hands-on sessions with Maxon, which are um, targeted to, well, beginners at least. This one is targeted to beginners. It's the Cinema for the Beginners workshop. And it started last week. Um, so the second session is ahead, it's gonna, happen tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, UK time and the topic is gonna be modeling and then there is another hands-on session about particles by Nick and Chad so they are going to cover uh, particle uh, techniques and so on and then we also have VFX and chill with Hashi and Seth uh, which is our show on Fridays and of course, well, everything will be hosted here on our Maxon training team channel where uh, you can find all of the recordings. Also the one of this session here, all of our sessions are recorded. And another thing, uh, which is already a little bit of a segue uh, of what I wanted to talk about next, uh, Maxon certifications. Uh, we've got a certification program uh, going on, a new one. And if you want to know more about the Maxon certification program, I, um, well, well, I want to tell you that this is a pretty cool video to watch because um, Thanasis made a really good overview um, about our certification program. You can also go to maxon.net slash certification and here you can see uh, that we have an elementary knowledge test or multiple of these. We've got Cinema 4D, Trapcode, Magic Bullet, Red Giant, and VFX Suite. The Redshift one is currently in the works, and so we hope we're targeting to release it this month. Um, and if you want to really get certified as a user or a trainer, you can find all of the information here, including the certification topics. Okay, I think that's almost it. You can also find um, a handout in the handout section, a little PDF, where um, there is some additional information, for example, about um, Lionel's courses he's, um, he has recorded previously. And there's also some discount attached to these uh, courses, which is quite cool. So definitely check the links out, um, the links in the PDF. And we're also giving away t-shirts, free t-shirts to our um, regular viewers. So all you have to do is uh, you have a look 
add the PDF, uh, there's a discount code and you get the t-shirt uh, for free. You only have to pay for the shipping. And of course, there are also yeah, more links, more useful links in this PDF. And yeah, that's that's the housekeeping part. And now one, one more important thing that Isaac noticed is that we I don't know if it's by accident or design, but we all are rocking the same design of one of these free t-shirts today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we didn't have a meeting about this. This is this is just how it ended up. Yeah. Magic. It's by it's magic. magic. It's magic. 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 Cool. So uh, you know, if you are ready, I would I am. throw the screen at you. I what don't have just... shirt. Sorry about that. <laughs> we we can no. help. We can help with that, you Lionel. Can... You will get one. So here you go. Okay. Now you should be able to share your screen. I can see your screen already. Well, actually, I can see either it is really wide. Yes, I should show instead the application. So I'm going to do that. And here we are. Here we are. OK. So now you can see Cinema 40 only. I can't see anything at the moment. Yep, I yep, can, I can see, see it. it. You can see it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, because I'm working here on a very wide screen. So I can't, I can't share my whole screen. And ah, here I just would like to be sure if I open another window, you can see it. Can you? Yeah. Settings, yep. Yeah. yeah. Just open the render settings. So, okay, so everything's fine. Whew. All right. Uh, <laughs> for your, your information, uh, I intended to, to do that on another computer. It just crashed before the webinar. And so I just switch everything on on another computer, which is table. I know this is going to work. So, and so here we are. Okay. So, yeah, about this webinar, we're going to talk about materials. So this is not going to be an advanced uh, webinar because I'm really going to talk about basic stuff uh, about how to create some very simple materials, as you can see here in the, um, my screen, uh, in my viewport and how to load texture and what are um, all the different map you can find on the internet and how to use them because i know uh, next week uh, jonas will be uh, showing how to create procedural materials so today i'm more focusing on texture texture from bitmaps from photography and so on and the problem is uh, there is a lot of different maps you can find on the internet uh, you can find um, well it depends on the quality and the provider of the picture. Some are um, professionals or are made by hobbyists. Um, the professional one, they, they, they're not always the best one. Some from hobbyists are pretty cool act actually. Some are pretty bad. Huh? And some need to be tweaked a bit to be used with Redshift. Huh? So I will just show you a few websites that I currently use. Uh, there are some free textures, some uh, paid ones, and how to load them inside um, Cinema 4D and use them with Redshift. So just before that, I would like to talk to you about something important about materials, uh, which are the PBR materials. So that's something I'm sure everyone has heard about it. It's, uh, it stands for physically based uh, rendering and uh, it's a workflow for treating maps, uh, bitmaps, uh, and use them inside a render engine. So specifically at the beginning, I think it was designed to be used for real-time rendering, but this workflow is so efficient that we it's used now everywhere, uh, including for our workflow, uh, which are our offline rendering. So not real-time rendering and you need to be aware of few things before working with pbr so you do not confuse for example glossiness map roughness map what is exactly albedo um, and some tricks about uh, linear and srgb uh, color profile so that all the maps can be used efficiently about this you have a very very nice uh, um, guide uh, which is uh, uh let, let me show i'm sorry i wasn't 
too much prepared for this one because um, this is not my usual computer. So this is the Substance team who authored, authored that, um, that guide. Guide. I'm going to find it very quickly. Just to show it to you. All right, and if I want to show, here we are. If I want to show this window, I need to go there. Okay, so now you can see the window. So this is a guide uh, made uh, from the, the guy from uh, Substance. And it has all the information you need to know about PBR, about uh, all the maps and so on. So I'm, I will be referring sometimes about it, uh, but now we're going to, to switch to Simmerfordin how to, to use that. So let's go back to Simmerfordin. Here it is. Okay. So in this scene, I have a shader ball. I'm going to disable the RPR. So this is just a simple shader ball inside um, in, inside Cinema 4D with a wall. I have created some light and so on, so we can work with it. And we have here already some materials with a lot of texture. I just put there and so on. So first we're going to take a look at a very simple uh, texture, which is the one I used for the, the intro picture for the webinar, uh, which are texture uh, that I have taken from a Substance, uh, some Quixel, sorry, Quick, Quixel, which is just the competitor of Substance actually. So Quixel, it's a um, dat database which has a lot of texture ready-made uh, um, to be used on Unreal, of course, but uh, on whatever engine you want, uh, if you know how to load them. So Substance has a bridge uh, that can load uh, texture for you, but you can have a uh, texture um, from uh, Quixel that you go you're going to load by yourself. So for this, uh, I'm going to use uh, some of those textures. So let, 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 just let me show you the final rendering. Okay, so we have a metal material, which is mainly made uh, with uh, some uh, texture from uh, Substance, some uh, from Quixel, I'm sorry. And we can see we have some nice reflection. We have some nice gloss, uh, roughness map um, and so on. I'm going to change a few options here. Uh, let's change here the scale to 100%. So here on the top, um, this is the new interface for Redshift. Uh, it's pretty new. I think it was um, it only a few weeks ago that they made this public. And now you have everything here on this, this panel. So this is the APR you have in your um, in your window, and I just uh, tear open that this uh, menu and put it here. And here you have one option. I'm going to put it, the scale to 100% so that it's not blurry and we have a nice definition. So here it is. Now we can see uh, the detail of the texture and so on and here we can see the shadow graph i have used to create all this about the light i'm using for this file only one just one dome light one hdr which is this one you can see here which is very nice for metal and reflective material uh, like metal okay so let's create from scratch a new material i'm going to recreate this one so i'm going to stop the apr for now let's create here a new material redshift material and i'm using here the node editor the new node editor inside cinema 40 and we should have 
somewhere here. Our map. Why can't I? Okay, yes. Because I need to change that. That's interesting. That's some problem you can have uh, yourself. If you want to use the node editor from Cinema 4D, no, so not the shader graph, you have here the node space, a current redshift. So this is uh, okay. And here in the material, I need to change from tools and use node material for presets. So now, if I'm going to create a new material again, I have the proper material and I can do whatever I want with it. So I'm going to squeeze this window. Let's put it here. And I'm going to load some picture I have on my hard drive. If I, I just move the window. Okay, yes. Um, we can still see it. Did you see the window, the explorer window? I should just show you if I put it on top on top of it. Oh no. No. Okay. No. Yeah. This is a problem. I'm really sorry about this, but um, I should have changed the computer at the last time. But <laughs> that's uh, the joy of um, streaming. So I would. I would like to show you the texture. Okay, no, no matter. You can use the uh, legacy content browser to show us the textures in the folder that way, if you'd like. Yes, that's a good or idea. Or drag and drop it into the picture viewer. Uh, I could also use the. Yeah, okay, yes. So let's go to our. Um... A picture viewer. Now we're just in front. You can see it. So now, yeah. here in the in my quick quicksol folder, I'm using those files. Um, okay. So we have the albedo file. Yeah, you can see it. This is the albedo file. This is going to be the color file for the, for the material. So because this is going to be a metallic uh, material, the albedo file is going to give the color of the reflection. That's, uh, that's because I'm going to use the metalness work workflow, metalness roughness uh, workflow, uh, which uh, works this way. Okay, so we have the albedo file. Uh, and I just talk a little bit later about the um, another way to create metal in Redshift. Okay, this is the one I use here because it's it's a quick solve picture. So we have this one. We have the metalness, which is interesting because it's pure white. Okay. So actually, I won't have to load this one because this is pure white. But I could do it. We will see there is no difference between them two. <laughs> Uh, and we will see later why it's interesting you have um, a map for metalness. It's uh, very interesting if you want to create mixed materials with, uh, for example, metallic pack and, and non-metallic part. For example, if you have chipped paint on a material, you want to reveal the metal beneath. Then we have the normal map and our roughness map. Okay, and the roughness map is actually the only one we can see really some details. There are some details on the normal map, but uh, we don't see it very well. Uh, but there are some on the roughness map, and the albedo also has some um, some details. Okay, so I'm going to load them inside. So I just need I'm grabbing them from another window, and I'm going to drag them into the viewport. So I'm going to take the metal nest also, albedo. Let's put them here. It's going to take some time to load. In the meantime, we have uh, one question here. So Chris was asking um, about um, your layout. He, he loves your, your layout in Cinema 4D and asked if you can share it. Yes, of course. It's very easy to, to create. Actually, I had to create it 
again uh, because I just changed my computer right on the. So I just created in a few minutes. Uh, if I go back, I'm a bit afraid if I do something here, it's uh, we're going to lose the focus. So I won't do it. But uh, you just need uh, to. Uh, well, let's try it. We will see. If I go back to standard, yes, it goes back and we lost it. So I'm going to show the application again. Huh? Can you see it? Yes. All right. Okay. So uh, if I want to create this layout, it's pretty easy. You go here, Redshift. Huh? So this is the new panel we have huh, with the, the latest version of Redshift. I'm just going to tear it open and then clicking here, I can put it on top. So that's one step. And then with my material here, if I double click, it's going to open this window. And this is our node editor. I just need to click on this one and put it right there. And that's it. It's as easy as that. Huh? Yeah, and it's really easy. So, and use yeah, cool. here, shift. I can use the appear and so on, but it's better, of course, to, to go uh, to use this one because I put it right there. And let's in the customization, so window customization, I'm going to save it layout as let's call it RS. And here we are. So we have our different texture. So it's pretty easy for now. Um, we just need, so yes, with the node editor, we can't see. This is something I really would like to have to, to know the name of the texture here. So you have to recognize them by, um, by eyeballing it, or you're going to see here. So this is the roughness. Let's put it there. And this is the albedo, albedo here. And we have here our metalness and here the normal map. Okay, so one very, very, very important first step that you should never, never forget because this is uh, paramount. I mean, I mean, this is the, the stuff you can't miss. All right, that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm saying it a lot. Uh, you need to take care of the author sRGB or the linear prof color profile. And I will explain later why. So concerning the color, the albedo, the diffuse, color albedo diffuse, they are not the same, but for the sake of simplification, I will say now they are the same. So we have here the albedo. You don't need to do anything. You're going to use the sRGB profile, which is the default one, because this is a JPEG. JPEG, PNG, bitmap, all those have a sRGB profile embedded usually uh, inside the file. I mean, 99% of the, of, the, of the time, it's sRGB. So for the albedo, you don't need to do anything. For all the other, all the technical map, let's say technical map, uh, you need to change here the gamma override. Okay, again, I stress this, this is very important. It won't work otherwise. Well, it will work, but not very well. You will have some false results. Um, it's not going to work the way it should. Okay, so I'm going to enable here gamma override. Also for this one, obviously, which is the roughness. And the metalness, well, it's useful because we won't use it. It's a pure white, but let's do it anyway. And they're all enabled, okay? So this is something to do every time when you load bitmaps, uh, you need to change the here the gamma override to have a linear color profile, okay? You don't need to do that when you use noises or surfaces you create inside Cinema 4D. So if I load a noise, Maxon noise, I, I won't need to do that, okay? And you don't need to do that for the color. So I'm going to plug the color in the color. Now we're going to take, so this one, which is the metalness. So in order to use the metalness, metalness workflow, because this is a Quixel, um, the maps are coming from Quixels. You go to the base property here, and you're going to change on the reflection, the final type uh, from IOR to metalness. Here you have two choice. 
either you're going to use your metalness map and plug it here on the metalness. So let's do it. This is the metalness I'm going to take here. And this is going to the reflection, this one. Uh, not this one, I'm sorry. This is going to be the this reflection, I'm sorry. And we're going to the metalness. So we can see here now on the material, this is driven by this texture. Okay. The other choice, because this is a pure white map and very often coming from Substance or other engine uh, can happen also with Substance, for example, uh, you don't really need to have a white, a white map. If you were using a real-time engine, we wouldn't have any other choice. But here in that case, Redshift is capable of not using it because it's pure white. So instead of plugging it, you will have the exact same result by putting here the metalness value to white, which is one, okay? Black is zero, white is one. So we have pure white. And this is the same effect here have as having a white picture, a white bitmap in this slot, okay? Next, we have here the, this is here the roughness and the roughness is going to the reflection again. Reflection and it's going in the roughness. You can see it has an effect already. And then we have here the normal map. Normal map need to go inside. So I'm going to double click to have um, the um, our menu. I'm going to load a bump map. So bump map, I'm going to put it there. And because here we're using a normal map, the normal map must go to the bump map. Bump map must be here in tangent space normal. Okay, I'm going to plug it here now, texture input, and the bump map go to here, the overall. So overall, which is right here, bump map. And our material is complete. Now I can apply it to our shadow wall. So I'm going to put it on top. Let's delay this one. I'm going to call it new metal so that I don't confuse it again. And now if I start my IPR, we have our material, so it's very simple. <laughs> I went very slow so that I'm sure everyone um, was following because you need to do this step every time you, you load uh, maps like this. So now let's take a look what happens uh, if you don't use this button here, you don't use the gamma override. It's, it's going to be especially uh, visible with the bump map. Uh, so if I change it here, you can see how much the material change. And you will see some very weird stuff, such as this one. You see here? This is very tricky because at a first glance, you could say, well, it works. It, it looks okay, it looks okay. But if you look closely, you will see some, some strange thing going on. So it can be very easy to miss that because you, you, the material looks looks all right, but there is already some problem with artifacts here. And you can see the whole reflection has changed. So if we go back to our texture here, and I go back to the gamma here, you can see it changed a lot. And now the artifact we had earlier are gone. Okay, it's going to be the same thing here with our glossiness. So if I, it's not, it's not going to be as shocking, uh, meaning that if I change here the glossiness, 
it's going to work, but as you can see, this is not the same again. It's not going to explode. Everything is all right, but uh, this is not the material uh, you would expect using um, this file. So let's enable it again, and we can see here the right material. So it's easy to miss. And I can tell you, I have seen quite a few tutorials uh, with people uh, just forgetting to use um, this button uh, because it's not very uh, self-explanatory. So why, why is that? Uh, I'm going to show you to construct um, a scene very quickly so we can understand why we have to enable this uh, tick box every time you're going to use a texture, a bitmap texture in Redshift. Um, before we jump into that, there was a question about um, the file types. So uh, John wanted to know, is it necessary to enable the gamma override for TIFFs and PNGs or just for JPEG bitmaps? Yeah, this is a very good question, very important. I should have told it. Uh, Actually, every, almost every file, yes, you need to activate uh, that tick box, except for the EXR, EXR format. EXR format is uh, linear because uh, it's designed this way. Okay, so this is the only exception. Uh, you can't, you can't find some JPEG, TIFF, PNG file with linear profile inside. It exists but it's very, very, very rare to find that. You, we can't say that doesn't exist. It does, but you have almost yeah. no chance to find it on the, on the net. So it's an easy rule after all. EXR, you don't need to activate the tick box because this is linear. All the other file type, all the other are going to be um, SRGB. So you need to linearize it by clicking here the tick box. So this is going, what we're going to do. We're going to put it linear, so a one, a gamma of one. So that's going to work, except for the color texture. So in general, uh, we can say that, um, well, it, it doesn't break anything. If you had a, a JPEG that is linear and you enable the gamma override and set it to one, this won't break anything it's just going to override the gamma and just doing the right thing so just as well as a, a good practice just always enable the gamma override whenever you're dealing with um with textures that you want to use to control um the parameters other than color exactly. that's basically the rule yeah so let, let's see exactly how, why uh, it's uh, this way. Here I'm creating a plane. I'm going just to add a displacement with it. So to use a displacement, we need to use here our redshift tags, object, and then the geometry override. I'm going to activate. Actually, we don't we don't really need the tessellation, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to deactivate here the screen space adaptive, I don't need that. Minimum edge length, I'm going to put it to zero. And the maximum subdivision, because this is a plane which has a lot of subdivision already. Six is way overkill, so let's put three. That should be enough. And of course, the displacement. Okay, because our plane is, uh, I scale it down to 130 centimeter, I would like to have a range of, so this would be one centimeter of displacement on a 130 centimeter square. That's not really a lot. Uh, it would be barely noticeable. So I'm going to put it to 65, 70. Let's say 70 here, the maximum displacement. Okay, so this is the first step. Now I'm going to create a material, redshift material, of course, Let's call it test. I'm going to apply it to our plane. And I'm going to load a displacement map. So this is this one. 
Now I'm going to load another tool, which is which is the ramp. So this is a ramp, uh, the basic ramp uh, gradient from Cinema 4D Redshift. I'm going to plug the ramp inside the displacement in the texture text map. So you can see here, this is yellow to yellow. That's an easy way to find your way um, inside all this stuff because you can see there is a lot of stuff. But there is actually only one which is yellow as the output here of the ramp node. So it means yellow goes to yellow and so on. And here the displacement uh, must go not inside the material, it must go to the output node. And you can see here we have some kind of light purple goes to light purple. Okay. Our displacement uh, is going to work on the height field, meaning it's, uh, it asks for a black and white image. So that's perfect because this is a ramp black and white image. And we're going here to put on the scale the same number we put here on the redshift tag. So 70. So this is going to be 70 here also. Okay, so it, I put it on the, um, on the map now, if I start the up here IPR, we can see the result. Let's go this way. I'm trying to find a view where we can notice that it's going to be this shape. Okay, so now let's go to our ramp. And yes, that's interesting because it's not the case in the shadow graph. I was surprised because I was going to tell you, you can see this is linear and this is not linear. You can see we have some kind of curve, some kind of slope. So that's why I went to see the gradient right away. And yes, you have an interpolation which is smooth. Uh, on the shader graph, uh, this is set as linear by default, which is a good thing. Uh, in here, it should be the same thing. So you can see our gradient here is smooth, not a smooth knob. We need to change them both to linear, to linear. And now this is linear. We can see, obviously, this is a straight line. Huh? Okay, so it works as it should. Huh? This is a gradient huh? going from black to white. Huh? So it does this thing. So now I'm going to stop this and just show you in the um, visualizer, picture view viewer, here it is. Uh, a texture I created uh, just before. So this is a gradient. Uh, this is a gradient I created on After Effects, uh, okay? So this is the basic gradient black and white uh, going from white to um, to black and i saved it as a png okay uh, jpeg no png yes png so uh, this has been created with after effect i just hit uh, output on uh, the hit render and i got this file and you can see this is obviously a gradient which looks like a gradient now I'm going to load this texture inside here. So it's loading. So this is our gradient. And I'm going to put it in place of the ramp. Okay, and I don't do anything about this. Now, if I start the IPR, so it's the other way. But anyway, we can see here, we have this kind of slope. Also, we have some artifact here. Um, we just need to increase a tiny bit the length of the whole thing. Maybe. Yeah, actually, it's, it's not important. But you can see here, there is a slope. Huh? There is this almost the same slope we had uh, with the gradient, uh, this one, uh, the ramp, uh, which was made on smooth. So now if I take this texture and activate the gamma override, uh, we're back on track. And here you can see really the effect. Why we have to change here this gamma override uh, 
on a PNG to do this. Okay, so I had prepared a EXR file to show you that on the EXR file, we don't need to do this, but I, I think I made, I made my point and that's enough. I just really wanted to make sure about this. Tick this box every time, except for the color. And you also showed us a nice way to visualize gamma core, uh, curves. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to our um, to our quick salt material here. So just to show you before I jump to another material, what we can do with this one. So let's go back here. Uh, it's not because you have downloaded a material from a texture bank that you're not allowed to touch it. You should, you should use it, uh, you should tweak it, uh, do whatever you want with it. And it's even easier be because this is a very good material. As you can see, there is no tweaking required. The rendering is exactly as it is on the um, like Quixel website. Well, depending on the light, of course, but it's uh, very, very close to the original. And this is a good material. So we, you, it's as easy as that, you put your materials and it works. But we can do a lot of stuff with that. We could change the color, and this is one of the most interesting stuff with uh, the true metalness workflow. So when you switch here the metalness workflow to have a true 100% metalness workflow, is that the color of the reflection here depends on our color, our diffuse color we have here. So that means if you want to have a gold material, a copper material, you just need to change your color here to a gold or a copper metal or whatever other color you want. So if I want to do that with the, this texture, we could do it very easily by creating a layer, color layer. And we're going to plug our original material, which is gray, as you can see. Let's put it back here to the color. So now, it just, just goes black because we have our second layer, which is pure black. Now I'm going to change the blend mode to average and we're going to change the color. So that's interesting. As you can, you, you have seen uh, when I have changed the material to pure black. So now normal, it means this is a pure black. Pure black means there is not no reflection anymore. So you're, diffuse color should be uh, colored. There should be some something inside. And now if I change so to average and I'm going to change the color here and I'm trying to eyeball some yellow color, gold color, you can see right away we have some nice material, nice gold uh, color. Very, very easy to tweak because uh, it really depends on your diffuse layer here. Usually, with the the standard workflow, the uh, the workflow we use most of the time, this is on the reflection panel, and you can see here on the reflection panel, the color reflection is gone. It's not there. You can't do it because the color of the reflection depends on the diffuse material. It's much more easy to to tweak and to change. So here I can change my color again. Here with my, I'm going to. Uh, to hold on this one and I can change here uh, my color to whatever I want. So if I wanted to have a blue, uh, a blue um, matter, it's pretty easy. You can see it's very, very close from the color we have here. Very easy to control, very nice. Huh? If we go to some kind of copper, copper would be this. Okay, so that's one thing we can do. The other thing we can do is tweak the roughness. And here it's pretty easy because this is again a very good roughness um, map. We can add to this a color correct. I'm going to put it right here so it's already plugged inside. And the color correct we have here the gamma. So here using just the gamma we're going to make the material more or less uh, rough. Meaning if I decrease here the gamma, 
we're going to have something uh, which is more reflective, uh, not as diffuse. With some nice reflection, we can recognize here the this one, the the area light from the from our dome light, and I can do the other way by increasing the gamma here. I make it making it rougher. And we could change by using, if I go back to our gamma here, to one, by using the level scale, I can decrease the overall roughness of the thing. So if I go back to 0 0.5, so it's not exactly the same as the gamma. The gamma is the contrast. The level scale is kind of overall level of everything. Here I could, could go back to 1.5. And you can see it's not exactly the same thing as we had before with the gamma when we I put it to two or something like that. And of course, you can use both. Another way to, to, to tweak your material would be to use a ramp. So if I take a ramp, and let's delete this one actually. I'm going to put the ramp here. So here we're going to Alt input and put the out color here. And yes, we have again this problem that that shouldn't be. You, you can see the problem here. Our map changed because we here are, have an interpolation which is smooth. It should be linear. So let's go back to linear on both of the nodes. Okay, so we are back here, and now I can change my material by dragging this one here. It's going to make it rougher again. Oh, the other way here. And here we, we go on the close up, we can see how it works. So some people prefer to use the ramp. Um, some prefer the color correct. Uh, both are good. It's very up to you, and to see what what's uh, what's interesting if you you want to tweak your material. If you're using the node material, yeah, you you need to be uh, aware that the ramp need to be tweaked to linear interpolation. And at last, one last thing we could do here on the bump map. On the bump map, you can add several bump map with redshift. It's pretty easy. Uh, you just need to find uh, uh, to use another bump map. So I'm going to look on my texture folder. Here it is, and I'm going to take some map so let's use for example let me show you on the picture viewer yeah you have some print scratch as you as you can see so this is a bump map i can use it by just dragging and dropping here and now i need so this one i'm going to that was the metalness that we don't use. I'm going to change the texture. We're going to add another bump map. And let's go back to add now the bump blender. So now we just need to put this texture inside here. Don't forget to activate the gamma override. And now I'm going to put on the bump blender. So this is my original bump map, the bump map from Quixel. I'm going to put it here, base. This one is going here, layer one as a bump input here. And the whole thing is going here to the overall. And yeah, there is a trick. As you can see, the blend weight is put to zero, so <laughs> it doesn't work. I need to put it to one. And now we can see our 
scratch quite a lot on top. So I'm going back to the texture here and let's change the remap to three. So it's going to uh, tile the texture inside the whole node. And this is, this is obviously much too strong. So you can change now by going to the bump map and here reducing the height scale. Let's reduce it to something like that. And we're going to put it minus. So now it looks like scratch, yes. And on the, your bump blender, actually, if you have your blend, blend weight to one, it's going to overlay uh, to um, to overlay this one. It's not going to show. So you need to on the bump blender to add additive mode. What's really great now is if I can control the weight of each one using here the slider or just using here the bump map of each at the right intensity. So if I go back to four, now I have more of the bump map of the original quicksand material. Let's zoom. Now you can see here some detail from the, this one. And here I could reduce again, let's put it something very, very light like this. You can see here, those are the scratches from this texture. And the tiny specks we have here come from this bump map from the quicksand material. So on the all, I have tweaked my material quite a lot. It changed a lot of stuff. It doesn't look like much of the original material. And we could create um, what a lot of stuff different material by just tweaking a few stuff uh, inside uh, in, inside here. Lionel, can I ask you a quick question? Sorry to interrupt. Of um, we've got a bit of a chat going on um, in the questions between some people are asking about the node system you're using um, and that versus like the Redshift shader graph. And yeah. so do you have a preference? Is there a reason why you're kind of doing it in C4D nodes as opposed to the shader graph. Uh, we've got a bit of a chat kind of going on in there, so I thought I'd ask. That's a good question. Actually, I changed it to the material node with this one because uh, here it's uh, it's it's prettier. And we have here when I change each node, uh, I have the option here. And also we have some solo button. So if I change, for example, I, I take this texture we have here on our um, where is it? Because I always, yes, solo node. It's going to solo here. You don't have to, 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 to do anything to the output and so on. So it's, it should be the best way to use Redshift. Huh? But there is some stuff. Well, as you can have, you have seen here the, on the ramp, huh? the ramp need to be tweaked. We don't have all the Redshift shader. And also, it, takes a lot of room so it's really up to you and many people still are still using the um, uh, shadow graph because it's overall a bit a bit easier it really depends i don't know what, what do you use uh, jonas or ellie which one do you use huh? so I for use the redshift shadow graph yeah see. It, yeah it, it depends um well, some, sometimes when I create something that I want to reuse, um, I use the Cinema 4D um, node graph because um, it allows you to um, create groups and assets out of groups that you can reuse. But um, as Lionel already uh, mentioned, um, not all of the Redshift nodes are available in the Cinema 4D um, node um, editor. So that's why I usually stick to the Redshift shader graph. Um, also, I like the the layout and the usability of the other one much more. Yeah, that's the same. same here. Same here. So that's very interesting to to note. Yeah, you you can um, this node editor. Uh, you can create assets, convert to assets. You can group. Uh, as Yuna said, it's very, very useful, something we can't really do. Well, kind of, it's not as powerful as this one. So really hope uh, they're going to, we're going to have all the, the Redshift node inside the Cinema 4D node.
I have a I have a question for you, uh, Lionel, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. So uh, you were showing us the uh, the working with the metal metalness parameter, right? Linking the texture to that. Um, so does this mean that the re reflectivity parameter is used to define which parts are like metal and which parts are not? Or is that all in metalness? I can see, I, I think I have time to show you something that's going to answer this question. Uh, it's, it's interesting because the metal work workflow is going to allow you to have a reflective and non-reflective material at the same time without using, uh, for example, the material blender. Usually, if you want to, to combine a reflective and non-reflective material uh, on Redshift, uh, you should go with the metal blender because it works pretty well and it's, it's easy to understand. But with the metal metalness workflow, you can't uh, you can't do without. You can do that with just one material. And actually, let's create a new material just to show this. So this is a brand new material, and let's uh, call it dielectric. And I'm going to apply it on our shadow ball. Okay, so this is the basic um, sterner material. And now let's go here. And if I change, so here we have an IOR. And if you wanted to create a, met, a metal material using this way, one of this way uh, will be to change the IOR, for, for example, to something, um, let's put something a bit crazy, 20. And then you don't really need your weight, your diffuse weight anymore. Okay, and we're back to uh, the metal metal. Okay, if we use uh, here the metalness, and let's put the weight here of the metal, as you can see, it looks like a kind of dull plastic, rough plastic. And the metalness here is going to transition from this plastic looking metal to a metal metal. And here we are. We have almost the same uh, kind of result that we had earlier. That's really, they're very close, as you can see. And this one here, the reflectivity, is the kind of the reflectivity of the non-metal material. So it makes sense if you have here a metalness of one, the reflectivity here is pretty much useless. If you have here zero, this is the default reflection. And if you change your value here, we're going back to the kind of standard material we have without the metalness, with the IOR of 1.5. So uh, the, the intensity here of the value, uh, it's, it's really from the, the PBO workflow, uh, something um, you can read in the, the PDF I mentioned earlier. And so if you want to combine uh, metal material and uh, metal material this parameter will have an effect you can change it you're not really supposed to change it on the pure uh, metal workflow uh, you're not going to change it but you can do it anyway it's going to break the um, the ener ener energy uh, conservation yes the energy conservation of the light, uh, meaning that the metal could reflect more light than it received. Okay, but here, if I change my reflectivity, something crazy, we're back to so you should never do that, but that's possible. So let's. So it, so if it's a pure white, then it's uh, it's no longer uh, physically accurate. Uh, this one here, yes. Okay. You, you tweak, you shouldn't, you shouldn't tweak this material. So the, in the PBR uh, material, they don't use Fresnel value. So the Fresnel value is driven by this. I'm, I'm simplifying it. You should really read the, the PDF uh, 
is really interesting because it explains everything in great detail. That's great. Thank you. So what's cool. interesting here? So I, I don't think I have time to to do to do that. It's too bad. But I I could I could create a material uh, using here uh, the metal nest. That what's interesting if you have some metal map which is not pure white or pure black. That gets interesting because you can combine different material with just one material. That's what I like with uh, this workflow. And obviously, yeah, uh, what's interesting with this workflow is you can use all the PBR map you can find on the internet, and there are a lot of them. Yeah, exactly. So you know uh, what you do when you have a metal nest uh, map. Yeah. Um, we've got a few other questions here. Um, so one question that I found quite interesting was, what is better and faster to use, JPEG, PNG, or TIFF? Well, JPEG is very popular because it's it's tiny and every everybody knows JPEG. Yeah? But uh, you still have you can have artifact from compression. But if you have a JPEG with the 12, 12 uh, setting quality base quality set, setting. Yeah? It's almost as good as a PNG, but yes, when I create texture, uh, I try to use only PNG because they are not compressed. So you won't never have any problem with the PNG, a good PNG, uh, opposed to a JPEG. But actually, uh, Quixel uh, use JPEG because they are uh, smaller anyway, and the artifact I'm talking about, they're invisible. So many 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 people use jpeg and that's quite all right just have to be careful about the compression yeah not too. exactly so um here's another one um here uh yeah he says newbie question here how do you increase the render quality within the ipr window similar to Lionel's quality i think that's that's a matter of gpu speed isn't it in yes, case, I have, because, because yours is cleaning up quite fast. Yes, I have a very monster good, machine. Yes, I have a very good GPU, so it's uh, the main reason why it's fast. And also about the quality, you have to be careful with the APR. Uh, you don't have this problem with, uh, of course, with the render view. But with the APR by default, the scale is set to 50. So if I put it to 10, you will see what I'm talking about. Yeah, so even with the very fast GPU, it just looks horrible because this is just one tenth of the pixels. And by default, it's on 50. So if you have a 1080 screen, uh, 50 is pretty bad. Huh? But if you have a 4K screen, 50 is all right. So that could be it also. But most probably, yes, I think it's, uh, the GPU, you must invest in a very expensive GPU. You have a very yeah. fast Redshift. What you just showed is something I ran into as well when I started using Redshift. Um, it's uh, it's good that you showed um, uh, this option. So, yeah, let me just scan the questions again. And Do you use a PNG if you need an alpha channel? That's maybe also a really good one um, to uh, to show the the alpha workflow inside of Redshift. And I think that's that's going to be the or I have one eye at the clock. But this should be uh, the last question before we wrap up. Well, but the, yeah, the PNG is very good because you have an alpha channel and you can use it. Uh, I don't have one on on the on the on my hand, but uh, let's use any any one any one. Just uh, so this is not even a PNG, but if you have a PNG which has an embedded alpha, you have to be very careful that it has alpha. Uh, you're going to use the um, split. Ah, color, yes, split color splitter, the color splitter here. And you're going to use, for example, I'm going to stop that. So this would be, for example, in the diffuse channel. And here you would put, and you can see here we have the out A, which is alpha. 
and you're going to use the alpha what, wherever you want. And usually it's on the overall opacity. And here you can use so the PNG, the alpha PNG, uh, but you must use the color splitter to, to, to take the alpha away and to use it for yourself. And I'm not going to hit render because if this is not a PNG, it doesn't have alpha, it makes no sense. But if it had been uh, alpha, uh, PNG alpha, that would be the way. Cool, thank you. So yeah, I'm going to wrap up. So I'm Thanks, going to that was awesome. wrap the screen back. Thank you very much. That was very That's enlightening. Great. So yeah, let me, let me share my screen. Here we go. And again, in case you've missed it, we are always going to record our sessions, or we always do record our sessions, and you can catch up if you um, if you came in um, late um, here on the Maxon Training Team channel on YouTube. This is where we upload all of the recordings of our sessions. Also, make sure to visit our um, Maxon events page. Let me go back one here. Here we go. That's that's the events page. And here you can see all of the events that we are running, um, including um, our hands-on sessions and VFX and Chill, as well as the 3D um, motion show. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. We are also going to share um, all of the files that we can share. So uh, we are going to add these uh, or link to these um, in the follow-up email. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So um, the last thing I can say is uh, thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you very much, um, Lionel, for sharing all of your knowledge. Also, thank you very much, Ellie and Darren, for answering questions in the background. And no we'll see you next time, either tomorrow on Thursday for Ask the Trainer or on Friday for uh, you know for VFX and Chill or next Monday for the next session um, about Redshift and procedural materials. Uh, procedural materials and Redshift. Cool. Exactly. Cool. So see you next week or tomorrow or whenever you prefer. Bye. And yeah, goodbye. Bye everybody. Bye, Bye. everyone.